We've looked at the first element necessary for a contract, that is agreement. The second element we need is intent. And by intent, we mean an intention to create legal relations. So it's an intention that you are gonna be bound by this particular deal. In reality, um, in business, the presumption is going to be yes. It's gonna be very rare that you don't intend to be bound if you have agreement and consideration. So it would be a rare instance when you would have to look at this genuinely. But for completeness, we're going to look um, at the, the background behind an intention to create legal relationships. It's actually become a little more complicated uh, since the turn of the century with how the High Court's treated it. So we're going to help uh, develop our legal thinking by looking at the traditional approach. And then I'll tell you kind of how the law looks at it these days. But I think the idea of the traditional legal approach gives us a way of thinking about the problem. And that's really what's behind the High Court's latest decision. But anyway, that all sounds very complicated when in fact the area of intent is fairly simple. So let's get into it. Now when we were looking at offer and acceptance, we were actually looking at making sure we had agreement but not every agreement is a contract. So for instance, if we decide to go out for lunch, we probably don't expect to end up in litigation if one of us does or doesn't turn up. So one of the things that distinguishes a contract from other types of arrangements or agreements is this intention. What did the parties intend? In the Irma Janus case, the High Court said, well, what you've really got to do is look at the conduct of the parties from the perspective of an objective observer. So what would an objective observer think? Were they behaving in a way that looked that they intended to create legally enforceable relations between each other or not? To get to that point, though, the courts have traditionally used a presumption and rebuttal approach. And to help us think about this, we've got a couple of cases to look at. The first case we have is Balfour and Balfour. Now in this case, we have a husband and wife. The husband was a civil servant who was stationed in Sri Lanka, or as it was known in those days, Ceylon. So he and his wife uh, went back to England. They took a bit of leave, went back to England, and it became obvious that she wasn't gonna, gonna go back to Salon. She had failing health, etc., and really needed to stay in England. He, prom he promised to pay her 30 pound or $30 a month as maintenance um, because they were living apart and she'd need some money to live. He subsequently wrote to her from Salon um, suggesting that they separate. So she stays in England and is getting this $30 and eventually they separate and he stops paying the $30. So the question here is at the time of the arrangement, did the parties intend that to be a domestic agreement or did they intend it to be legally binding? The courts held here that this was actually a domestic arrangement and people in families often agree to things and don't think they're going to be sued. Expect a legal relationship to result from any agreement. A second case here is Edwards and Skyways. So in this case, Edwards was a pilot who worked for Skyways and he was going to be made redundant. As part of his redundancy, um, the airline said that if he took some of his money out of the company pension fund, um, they would contribute an ex gratia payment. So a payment for, no, they would give him some money if he did this. Edwards agreed and withdrew his contribution. The company then ran into more financial difficulties and they went back on this promise about the ex gratia payment. So the question that came up here was whether this agreement between Edwards and Skyways was uh, a legal one. Did both the parties intend to create le a legal relationship? And the court held that there was an intention to create a legal relationship. The key legal principle is that agreements that are made in a business context generally attract an intention to create legal relationships. So what we can see is the courts traditionally make two important presumptions. One, if an agreement is a social or domestic one, it's presumed the agreement is not intended to be legally enforceable. Where the agreement is a commercial or business one, it is presumed that the, that the people agreeing to it intend 
legal relationships to be established. Now, it's important to recognize that these are only presumptions. They can be rebutted. But having said that, it's very hard to rebut the presumption in a commercial or business setting. In fact, you almost have, well, you actually have to have explicit words um, that state you're not intending to be legally bound. And even then, it's questionable. So really, if you enter a, a kind of agreement, uh, particularly if you reduce it to writing, etc., in a business context, it'll be taken that you intend to create legal relationships. Very rare exceptions to that. The problem more comes about from social and domestic arrangements. So when, when you're in a social or domestic uh, situation, do you actually intend to create legal, legal relationships? When can you rebut this presumption? So there's a couple of cases to give us some idea around this. The first case we're going to look at is merit and merit. So in this case, the husband, the defendant, had actually left the family home to live with another person. And the original husband and wife reached an agreement where the husband was going to transfer his interest in the jointly held matrimonial home to his wife. Okay. Then the husband refused to honour that agreement and she sued for breach of contract. So normally we've said that the presumption is that there's no intent to create legal relationships in a social and domestic relationship, when in a social and domestic context. However, here the court held that there was an intention to create legal relations. Why? Because the parties had separated when they'd actually made the, made the agreement. So what you'd had was kind of a breakdown in the marriage. And under those circumstances, when you make um, an agreement in that context, it's, it's quite different than if you're actually living together in a harmonious marriage where you don't expect to litigate. Once the marriage is broken down, it's different. And so in this case, there was an intent to create legal relations. Finally, we've got this case of Trevi and Grubb. Now, lotteries end up surprisingly uh, often in court. And in this case, we had three people who were in a syndicate and they won $218,000 in a lottery. The ticket was in the name of Grubb and he who refused to share the prize with the others, one of whom was Trevi. Now, Trevi had contributed regularly to the purchase of lottery tickets by the syndicate. And the question before the court was, did the parties here intend the purchase of lottery tickets by the syndicate to have legal relationships associated with them? So the question is, was this just a friendly arrangement that there, and there was never any intent of the parties to enter into legal relations? Well, the court said no. The court said no, the nature of the arrangement between the people was such that they must have thought it would be enforced if they won. Okay, there was such a large amount of money involved that there was a contract and that the plaintiff was entitled to their share of the winnings. So agreements made between friends in a social setting or between members of a household, close family, are presumed not to be legally enforceable. This also applies to voluntary work uh, because if it's enforceable, you're not, you're not volunteering, right? So there's a, there's a bit of logic behind that. However, this doesn't mean husbands and wives or relatives or friends can't make contracts with each other. What you have to do is rebut the presumption. So you have to be able to convince a court that under the particular circumstances, you actually do intend to have a legally enforceable contract. And as we've seen, that is possible under lots of circumstances. The key rules about intent. If you make an agreement in a business situation, the presumption is you intend to create legal relations. It's very hard to uh, rebut that presumption. Second, if it's a social or domestic arrangement, it's often presumed or the situation is such that an objective observer would tend to say you don't intend to create legal relations. But you can rebut that if the evidence shows it was serious enough, the consequences are serious enough, or the relationship was such that you did intend that this agreement would be enforceable. Okay, that means we've done agreement and intent. We've only got consideration to go.